I don't expect the pop culture version of the world to bear much resemblance to the real thing. It exists to distract and entertain, of course, and in doing so must grab our attention for as long as possible and by any means necessary. But even when we admit our disbelief is suspended, as we stare at the antics of those flickering screens, the stereotypes and imagery have a funny habit of burrowing into our minds and rooting there. As a result, homesteaders face their share of strange misconceptions when watching pop culture representations of their lives. Sometimes it's funny to compare our experiences of homesteading reality with the flat screen cutouts the movies, shows, or video games hold up. Other times it can be frustrating as we realize that our friends or family in the city believe those images are anywhere close to an accurate representation. As someone living this life, all I can tell you is that being misunderstood is par for the course. Not everyone will understand why we do what we do unless they're living this life themselves. So we might as well laugh a little bit at the homesteading myths and cliches. With that said, let's take a look at a handful of details about homesteading life that pop culture gets totally wrong. Number one, hay piles. One of the most iconic elements of the Assassin's Creed series is the Leap of Faith, where the likes of Altair and Ezio fling themselves from the heights of historical landmarks and land safely on the ground below, with accompanying eagle sounds, of course. The key to the eponymous assassin survival is landing on a conveniently located shock-absorbing hay pile. These life-preserving stacks of grass are also excellent locations to hide, concealing the player's character within a second. We willingly go along with the adventure, of course, because the stories are fascinating, the protagonists are intriguing, and there is nothing like a heroically dramatic Templar evading exit to round out a cops and robbers chase. Those of us who deal with actual hay piles, however, would never launch ourselves into them. True, loosely piled hay is springy to walk on, but a real haystack is surprisingly dense and solid. These fodder-keeping structures are the barn's so-called root cellar, keeping food for the larger livestock dry and edible through the cold winter months. And they're packed tight. In order to fit as much food for the stock as possible, many old-time hay piles were densely, strategically, and expertly arranged to both stay dry and shed water. Number two, chickens. With the way they're represented, the ubiquitous chicken is all one of the most poorly understood creatures in Hollywood. I'd give bald eagles a close second, as they're always shown soaring and screeching with the borrowed, bold call of a red-tailed hawk <coughs> and not their authentic, somewhat uninspiring squeaky chitter. Take, for instance, the chickens in The Legend of Zelda series. Of course, we accept their ridiculous antics are indeed ridiculous and readily convert it to pop culture lore with a nostalgic grin. Nevertheless, the chickens in this long-running series have been endowed with characteristics that far exceed the natural abilities of any barnyard hen. If you hold a bird over your head, you're more likely to get pooped on than to float safely away to the ground from any height. And if you were to hit a hen with your sword, the rest of the flock would probably just cluster around the rooster in fear of you, rather than mass in a coordinated attack to send you to the death screen. Now thankfully, real chickens are a lot nicer than the death-dealing poultry of the franchise. Some are downright cuddly, such as the Floofly, Cochin, or the Gentle Orpington. As you'll see in our helpful chicken breed database, if it's a feathery pet or a docile kid-friendly bird you're hoping for, there's a breed out there that will fit the bill, or or beak. I'll also extend an honorary mention to the chickens of Red Dead Redemption 2. Now this game is rightly renowned for its absolutely gorgeous panoramas and acute attention to historical detail, representing the 1890s western landscape in a complicated immersive story. There's a single detail to this game that tells me that some of the folks at Rockstar Games do not have chickens of their own. As Arthur gallops across the plains and mountains, he often passes homesteads, and every once in a while, no matter what hour of the night, those familiar fowl are out scratching and pecking. As those of us with coops in the backyard know, no chicken worth its salt would ever linger outside after sundown. Number three, foraging. I bequeath the 2004 film Into the Wild with the award for the most erroneous representation of foraging. The storyline of the film itself is a fascinating look into the mind of a young man disenchanted with his upbringing and longing for a more meaningful life, something many of us can relate to even if we don't run away to Alaska. The well-known ending to the story is, however, that Chris McCandless dies in an abandoned bus, alone, and despairing. The film is based on a tragic true story, but the cause of McCandless's death has been completely synthesized and rewritten in the film, though the true nature of his death is somewhat shrouded. It's likely that he died of starvation. In the film, however, Chris dies from ingesting a wild plant that the film deliberately wrote to be poisonous for the sake of the story. They went even so far as to write a falsified entry in the real-life plant guide that Chris reads in the film, though the actual book pairs no such toxicity warning for the plant question. As someone who uses foraged plants and mushrooms for hundreds of my meals every year, I get frustrated at the Hollywood wild food 
boogeyman that haunts my conversations with folks who don't forage. Because of the deliberately sensationalized moments in films like these, they believe I'm playing a botanical game of Russian roulette when I head out with my basket, rather than just collecting nutritious and safe foods. For those interested, a much more thorough and well-written essay on the foraging aspect of the film in question can be found in Samuel Thayer's book Nature's Garden. The essay is available to read at the link in the description box below as well. And for those interested in learning how to forage with knowledge and no fear, I humbly recommend our earlier video on the basics of getting started. Number four, Backwoods Hicks. When I first moved into the country, the people I left in the city immediately began asking if talking to my neighbors felt like reliving a scene from Deliverance. Now I'm decidedly not a movie buff and I never saw the film, but from the way they talked it seemed as though a rural community only picked bandos on their porches and had disturbing affections for their pigs. Eventually I looked at the plot of the 1972 film on IMDb and I'm kind of glad I've never seen it. Now I'm not here to hate on a decades old film that I still haven't seen, but I am curious about these strange touchstones that add to the cultural zeitgeist of a historical self-sufficient rural folks. They've been given a pretty dirty turn in popular films. They're written often as toothless, inbred, unintelligent people closer to animals than real modern humans. I suppose this cliche is supposed to make us feel like we've advanced far beyond scratching in the dirt for our food since now we can boop a phone app and make it appear on the front porch instead. One interesting thing about Deliverance is that it was filmed in Rabin County, Georgia, a rural Appalachian community full of the very sort of country folk that supposedly populated the horror film. If you're familiar with the Foxfire series, you're already aware that there's a far more accurate representation of the self-reliant communities of Rabin County to be found. I recommend the first three or four books in the series most. They're full of interviews with mountain residents who truly knew how to live on their own land. Sure, the elderly folks they interview might be missing a few teeth, and they may talk in a manner seemingly quaint to modern ears, but I honestly would gladly trade my college degree for the knowledge of how to grow and preserve food through the year like they did. Number five, scythes. My brother-in-law once told me that his favorite weapon in Dark Souls 3 was some sort of deadly designed scythe. I couldn't help but laugh, however, at the thought of this graceful, gentle tool as the weapon he described in the game. Now, Dark Souls isn't the only culprit in scythe assumption, however. The giant razor-sharp blade on the original lawnmower undoubtedly inspires awe in those who have never handled one. It looks like it would and should deal damage with ease, but the fact is a scythe blade is a finely honed, delicate instrument. You would never swing it around over your head like the characters do in video games. Scythe blades never slice through the air. They skim a few inches off the ground, held horizontally, and shearing grass blades as easy as a thought. The sight of a person using one skillfully looks as graceful as a dance. Furthermore, the long blades can be easily damaged by running into a stone or a hard object, something that the true scythe wielder dreads. Now, when it comes to self-defense or battle, pretty much any other garden tool would be a better weapon than a scythe. But when it comes to blissfully quiet hay cutting or grass-free prairie grass maintenance, you could do no better than a scythe. Number six, homestead daily life. Cable television shows like Mountain Men or Homestead Rescue have a job to do. They want to entertain you for a set amount of time. To do so, they need to have some sort of problem for their rural off-grid stars to face, like a bear attack, a blizzard, floods, or roads blocked by fallen trees. The general tone seems to be that these hard-living folks are fighting tooth and nail to cling to existence in their wild homesteads, always preparing for the next disaster, not having to wait a long time for it to arrive. Reality of homestead daily life is that it's, though it's full of hard work, it's often peaceful and enjoyable. That's why we chose this life after all. Sure, there's the occasional sick chicken, escaped goat, or horn worm chewed tomato but there's also a whole lot of good, wonderful, quiet, and satisfying days. A day spent mending fences, milking goats, tending the garden, and gathering fresh eggs may not make for exciting television, but it does make for good living. Now, since I'm an off-grid homesteader, I don't like to spend much time vegging out in front of my non-existent screens, so I know I've missed out on plenty of other examples. But I'd love to hear from you. Where have you found that the mass media representation of homesteading has totally, hilariously, or frustratingly gotten it wrong? Share some examples below and we can all have a laugh in solidarity.